This morning, is Texas really a toss-up? Mayor Rudy Giuliani is on our program on what election night will look like in the Lone Star State and his recent cameo in that new Borat film. He once led the Republican National Committee, but former Chairman Michael Steele now backs Joe Biden. Will the GOP survive the election? One of our questions for him. El Paso hospitals are full. The city implemented a curfew over COVID and winter hasn't even begun yet. Mayor DeMargo is with us on how critical the next couple of weeks really are. And what will our roundtable be watching for as election results come in on Tuesday? We're going to ask them. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to you on this first day of November. Hard to believe it's here, but we are 48 hours away from Election Day as well. So let's get you caught up on the top political headlines across our state. Texas turnout for early voting. It was record breaking. More than 9 million Texans voted early and that beat the total turnout, including Election Day four years ago. 9 million voters. That's almost half of all registered voters in our state. Days before the election, we've already seen several Democrats officially announce they're going to run for Speaker of the House. State Reps Sinfronia Thompson from Houston and Trey Martinez from San Antonio there were among the first to announce they are running. Since then, five others, including four Republicans, have announced as well. Democrats though need to win at least nine seats on Tuesday night to gain majority control in the House and have the best shot at installing a Democratic Speaker. And Texas Land Commissioner George P. Bush is reportedly considering whether to run for Texas Attorney General. The Texas scorecard reported this out the other day. Bush said to be keeping all options open. The current Republican Attorney General, Kent Paxton, faces new accusations of bribery and abuse of office by seven people from his inner circle. We have a lot to discuss about the election in a moment, but let's begin first with what is happening in El Paso. COVID has come back there at unprecedented levels. Hospitals in El Paso are full. Non-essential businesses are ordered closed for two weeks and a curfew is now in effect in the county. With us right now is El Paso's Mayor D. Margo. Uh, Mayor, it's good to see you again. We appreciate you joining us considering what's happening there. Thank you. Happy to be here. Can, can you give us an idea? You know, winter has not yet begun, obviously, but give us an idea of what modeling shows what might happen in the coming weeks there in your city. Well, we're, of course, the, just with the pandemic alone, you know, uh, we had 1,300 plus announced today. We've also had a situation, though, um, the flip side was actually our ICU went down some. So we're just trying to get our arms around it. We have, uh, you've got the beginning of the flu season that started in, uh, in October. I think we've had somewhere between one and five just flu uh, issues which are critical to us, or which will be critical to the space. But uh, right now we've, we're uh, dealing with the Texas Department of Emergency Management and their the tents that they brought out, the pressurized tents that are at, uh, at our hospitals. In addition to that, I toured yesterday our uh, alternate care site right. being set up right. at our convention center, which um, will house 50 initially um, COVID patients and can, can expand to 100 if it's required. And it's the same organization that was in New York in March and, and in the Rio Grande Valley uh, a few weeks ago well, and uh, is now here. M Mayor, let me ask you about this. A lot of people are obviously watching to see what happens on Tuesday. We're, we're pretty close to Election Day. How do you think the pandemic might affect turnout on Election Day itself there in El Paso? Well, the, the thing I, I, I think we're doing fine. Our turnout so far from the numbers I've seen and the county oversees the election, so I don't have all the exact right. stats has been very high. I think the real concern would be, which won't withstand legal uh, scrutiny, is the uh, is the shutdown that the, the county judge announced yesterday and unfortunately never even discussed with me for, before announcing it. And uh, I understand the attorney general has said it doesn't hold up. And I think that would have done more to uh, jeopardize turnout than, than uh, and what we're dealing with with the pandemic. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about next, that the county judge has imposed a curfew, ordered non-essential businesses to close down, and it sounds like you don't agree with what the county judge did. I understand definitely how, what this, what this pandemic is doing to people. It is just this unequal balancing act between our public, our health, our, our, our health and our financial health and our emotional mental health. Uh, right now, we've been dealing with this for some time. 
we're a community of mid-size and small businesses for the most part. We don't have a lot of corporate headquarters here. Uh, we only have one now um, of any significance. The, uh, the issue is we've got, in addition to all of this, first of all, the, the spread, what we're gathering is this spread is community spread and it is not coming from any individual businesses per se. It's coming from people shopping, yeah. going to restaurants, which we we initiated a uh, closure of the kitchens. I did two weeks ago at nine o'clock and, and then take out only after that. And it's coming from travel to Mexico, which we're the largest U.S. city on the Mexican border. And uh, there's family on both sides and commerce on both sides. And it has been that way for over 350 years. So that's one of our challenges. But the other part of it is the fact that we have 32,000 El Pasoans on unemployment who have filed for unemployment. They don't know what they're going to do and how they're going to put food on the table, pay for their own medical care. We can't afford a shutdown. The shutdown doesn't address where, the, where this is coming from. As, I, as my staff talked to people in the Rio Grande Valley, what they came up with uh, when they were going through this was in their deep dive, they found out it was mostly coming from family gatherings right. within homes. And, and if that is true of the case, a shutdown of businesses doesn't do anything to, ex to, to alleviate or remove that problem. Mayor, let me ask you this in our final moments here. What is the answer? How does El Paso, the city and the county get their hands around this and, and, and reduce these numbers? About 30 seconds left here, sir. But it's still, it goes back to the basic behavioral issues that all epidemiologists throughout the world talk about. You got to wear face coverings, maintain your distancing, and uh, wash your hygiene. I mean, yeah. uh, you, can't, you, you can't let that go until we have a vaccine. All right. Mayor DeMarco, we appreciate your time and good luck to you guys in El Paso. Thank you. Let's update you now on that scandal surrounding the Texas Attorney General that could have political implications. Last month, Attorney General Ken Paxton's top seven attorneys in his office accused him of bribery and abuse of office. In the weeks since, every single one of them have now been fired or they have quit or they are on leave. Let's go to Austin now and Ross Ramsey, the co-founder and executive editor of the Texas Tribune. Good morning to you, Ross. Good morning, Jason. How are you? Hey, doing well here. Uh, you know, Paxton isn't getting any public support from fellow Republicans, and now George P. Bush is circling the waters considering a run. Does, does Paxton have a strategy here, and can he survive this politically? I think he has a strategy. He hasn't really revealed what it is yet. You know, they're pursuing the thing as if he is the wronged person here, and if all of those, as, I, as if all of those staffers were wrong. Um, we'll see how this plays out. There's an investigation underway. Uh, DPS and some others are looking at this and trying to figure it out um, and we'll see how it plays out politically though it's clear that a lot of people or a lot of the rats are leaving the HMS Paxton um, <laughs> you've got uh, Dan Patrick Glenn Hager and Chip Roy a uh, light governor a controller and a congressman all giving back donations from the donor who's involved in this as you say you've got George P Bush looking at or talking out loud about a run for AG it doesn't look yeah. good politically Tell us about this story that the trip published the other day about the state board that uh, just killed a rule that would have turned away or would have let social workers turn away clients who are LGBTQ or disabled. This, this sounds crazy here in 2020, but it is that year. They put this rule out. Uh, they got an immediate backlash. It's a board called the Texas Behavioral Health Executive Council. It's a little known board, huh. but they rescinded their rule. They rescinded it unanimously. I think the backlash was heard and acted on very quickly and those services have been restored. Wow. All right, Ross, back to you in a moment. Thank you. Coming up, Rudy Giuliani is on our program. Why has Trump made Texas a toss up and what Giuliani says he's now planning after appearing in that new Borat movie? Plus, Michael Steele, the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, taking our questions about backing Joe Biden and whether the GOP can survive after Tuesday night. You're watching Inside Texas Politics. Thursday's election has created a lot of anxiety, so we dropped an extra episode of Yolitics the other day to ease some of that, maybe. This one is about campaign swag, vodka and soda. Seriously, the company's making the most of the market right now, using their labels to lighten folks up and urge them to go vote. You can check it out now if you have your iPhone or a mobile tablet handy. Just aim the phone's camera at the QR code on your screen there. 
It'll open a brand new window on your device and take you directly to those episodes. You can subscribe there as well. And remember, new episodes drop every Tuesday. We have two big names with us in this segment. Our first is Michael Steele. He used to be the chairman of the Republican National Committee, but says he will not be voting for Donald Trump on Tuesday. Instead, he's backing Joe Biden. Mr. Steele, thanks for the time. Hey, it's good to be with you. You've never been a fan of President Trump, but uh, you came out and publicly backed Joe Biden uh, recently here. What was the breaking point for you? Uh, there were a lot of breaking points <laughs> over the last three three years ago or so. You know, look, I, I've worked with Donald Trump in the past, so this wasn't something new. Um, I did not uh, support his candidacy in, in 2016. I thought that there were better men and women qualified to be president who ran in the Republican primary. What was disappointing to me was to watch their wholesale capitulation to a guy who was neither a Republican nor a conservative. But that is what it is. OK, um, since that time, it has been important for me to assess not just the policies. Look, I like tax cuts just as much as the next fella. I love our Supreme Court uh, uh, nominees. I know two of them um, from our Catholic circles. Um, and, and so all of that's fine. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, something that has been an important linchpin for the American people since our founding is our faith in the character and our trust in the individual. So character matters. Uh, the ability to lead through difficult times matter. Um, and I found the president wanting on both of those fronts. That's my personal assessment. Voters will make their own. Um, but for me, as a, a lifelong Republican, I've been a Republican since I was 17. I just turned 62. So I've been in this game a while. And I was a Republican when it wasn't popular. I was I was a Republican when um, no one could, you know, would give us a second look. And I remember inheriting a party in which that was the case back in 2000, 2009, when we were just def resoundingly defeated in 2008 and Obama right. sitting there. So those those issues all played a part for me in terms of where the party is and where the party needs to go in order to return to being a, a, a governing party that the American people would trust. Mr. Steele, obviously, you led the uh, the RNC, and I'm curious what you think the Republican Party looks like on November the 4th. Win or lose, does the mm -hmm. GOP survive because it is shedding so many longtime veteran members, loyal members like yourself? Yeah, it, you know, I, I refer to myself now as a Motel 6 Republican because someone's got to keep the lights on, you know? And so I'm on the front boards going, no, it's, it's still good. We're open. We're open. But we got to do some cleanup inside before you come in. And I think that's what you're going to see happen. You're going to see uh, a lot of, of, of you know, hand-wringing, whether Trump wins or loses, because the internal identification of who we are and what we believe and what we stand for has got to get vetted out. You know, are we the party that stands with Vladimir Putin? Are we the party that stands, party that stands with Kim Jong-un? Are we the party that puts children in cages? Are we the party that believe that they're fine people on both sides? Or do we believe something different? Uh, we're a party right now without a platform. The National Party basically gave up and said, well, whatever Trump wants us to be, that's what we'll be. I don't believe in that. I don't ascribe to that. So I want to fight over those ideas and those values. Um, and we'll see how it turns out. It begins regardless, as you know. Um, if President wins, the battle for 2022 and 2024 begins. If the president loses, the battle for 2022 and right. 24 begins. So right. that is going to be a big part of our identification with the American people. M Mr. Steele, we appreciate your time, sir. You got it. Take care now. Now to another high profile Republican, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. How will Trump do in Texas? That is the big question everyone is asking right now. And the one that we posed to Mayor Giuliani. Mayor, thank you for the time. You're welcome. Texas is a toss up for the first time in decades. And a lot of people are asking uh, how and why President Trump has turned such a sure state for Republicans. Turn it you know, now up for grabs. Well, I think it's a product of two things. It's a incessant, totally unfair media that now is imposing censorship on critical facts, which, if known, would lead anyone to say that Joe Biden shouldn't even be considered for the presidency. I mean, these facts in the hard drive show that for 30 years, he and his family have been taking massive bribes. 
basically admitted by his son, uh, but based on big tech, big media, even Mr. Bobolinsky, who's a witness, wasn't able to uh, get on television. It's absurd what they're doing. Well, you you mentioned the the uh, Hunter <clears throat> Hunter Biden story, uh, Mayor. Even Senator Ted Cruz from here in Texas says that that story isn't moving a single voter. Why does the campaign continue on with that? If you can well, tell Ted, I, I have great respect it. for Ted, but he's wrong. The only reason it's not moving a single voter is voters don't know about it. I, I don't want to just talk about Hunter Biden in the interview. A lot of folks here in Texas are interested in hearing from you as well, too. But I, I want to get back to that first question. Texas is a toss up. And this is a state that has voted Republican since 19, uh, what, 1980 with uh, with President Reagan. And obviously, the, the numbers have kind of trended down in 2016. And now it's a toss up. And a lot of Republicans are wondering, you know, what in the world happened? Democrats are certainly excited about it, though. Republicans will win Texas. This is all part of the pre-arranged fake news that the media engages in, like the censorship they're doing. You think those polls are correct? When Joe Biden has 14 people show up for him and President Trump has 30,000? They weren't correct last time, my friend. Regardless of the outcome nationwide, will you accept the results of the election? Well, of course I will. I'm an American. I'll accept it. I won't accept a stolen election any more than, uh, I mean... This is a ridiculous thing that's being said. I mean, the only one who's really contested an election ever is a Democrat, Al Gore. CPAC said the other day that is considering uh, suing over that scene in the new Borat movie. Obviously, you were in the film as well, too. Are you considering legal action? Uh, of course I am, yeah. I mean, they completely falsified what happened. And I filed, I, I, I called the police on them, which they, right. they don't mention. Are, are you going to sue the, over it? I have the footage of them running, running out, running away from the police. Are you going to sue over that, Mayor? Well, I'm certainly considering it right now. I want to get past the election. I don't want any distractions. But, you know, what they did was really uh, horrible. They were trying to I have the script of what they were trying to get me to do. And I didn't do it. And even though I didn't do it, they sort of suggested that I did. Mayor, we appreciate your time. Thank you. 48 hours away from the election, and our roundtable is up next with the races they'll be watching closest on Tuesday. We're back in a moment. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Ross is back with us. Bud Kennedy from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram is here each week. And, of course, Bernadine Steptoe, the political producer at WFAA in Dallas, joins us for the segment as well. Ross, I'll start with you. Uh, we are 48 hours away from Election Day. What's the one thing you're really watching for on Election Night? Uh, I'm watching the Texas suburbs. They moved a lot in 2018 and advanced some Democrats. I think they're going to be the difference in the presidential race, in the legislative races, and in congressional races on Tuesday. Specifically, you're looking at what, Collin County, Williamson County, Fort Bend, Montgomery, what, yeah. are, you, what are you looking at? All of those, uh, Hayes and Williamson County by Austin. Tarrant County is not really a suburb, but a bunch of it behaves like a suburb. Mm -hmm. That's a real place to watch. I think those are the places where this is gonna turn. Wow, Bud, how about you? What are you watching for election night? You know, Tarrant and Collin are big. I, you know, most of all, I'm watching to see the late vote that rolls in you. Know, we learned two years ago not to take the urban and suburban vote as the as the final vote and to watch how West Texas goes and whether the turnout there is as big as it needs to be for, to keep the Republicans in power in Texas. That's a great point. We've talked about that as well, too, because, you know, two years ago for the U.S. Senate race with Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke, Bernadine, uh, Beto got out way early in, in a lead in the urban areas, and then the rural vote came in, and Ted Cruz ended up uh, defeating him. What are you watching for on election night, Bernadine? Actually, I'm watching the black vote. Because if you look at the uh, what has happened over the year, the Black Lives Matter movement, the black vote has to get out. And if it's not going to come out during this election, when is it? And also, you almost have the Black Lives Matter movement the, it, the uh, legitimacy of it is almost on the line. So that's what I'm going to watch. I want to see if the black vote will actually turn out and turn out in big numbers. I think that the largest turnout they've had is what, since 2008, they did come out for Barack Obama the next uh, election cycle, but I'm going to be watching for it. Hey, Ross, let me ask you, I mean, I, I've always been told that the Republican, Republicans go vote regardless, rain or shine or anything. And because of that, there's a ceiling for Republican votes. 
We don't know who all these early voters are, these 9 million plus who have voted early. W would this break to the left or the right? Or, or what do you think? Because so many of them are new voters. Well, I think that's why everybody's talking about it. We don't exactly know. You know, there are a lot of people voting in this election who don't have primary history with either the Republicans or the Democrats, either because they're new voters or they're new to Texas. And, you know, the conventional wisdom in Texas has been that a larger turnout is a little less red or a lot less red. Uh, if that's the case, then this is a big Democratic year. But it's not necessarily the case. I mean, there are probably a lot of dormant Republicans as well. Dormant Republicans, not something you, you think much about here in, in Texas. Uh, Bud, go ahead. You're about to say something. I want to ask you something as well. Too, I was though. about to say it, it is a 50-50 race, and I can't emphasize this enough. I mean, you know, the Republicans have a little bit of an edge in early voting, but you know, all the, uh, the the unknown voters are likely to slightly favor the Democrats. Right now, it is a 50-50 race across the state. People have another day to vote. Wow, 50-50 uh, race is hard to believe we're, that's where we are. Bernadine, I want to ask you uh, briefly about Texas Democrats. They put all their energy really into the bottom of the ticket trying to flip the Texas House. Is that working? How, how likely is that to come to fruition for the Democrats? Well, I think the word likely is the proper question here because we won't know until election night. But they are putting a lot of efforts in there because the down ballot is very important to them because they're trying to take the state house. And the state house is important to them. So we will know on election night, but I think it's going to be very, very helpful to them if it actually works. If it actually works, indeed. Good deal, guys. We appreciate your insight as always. Thanks so much. And thank you for watching as well. We are back next Sunday with another episode of Inside Texas Politics. Don't forget to go vote on election day if you haven't already. Have a good week.